what we now have is evidence that chemical weapons have been used inside of Syria, but we don't know how they were used, when they were used, who used them. We don't have a chain of uh, custody that establishes what exactly happened. And when I am making decisions about uh, America's national security and the potential for taking additional action uh, in response to chemical weapon use. I've got to make sure I've got the facts. President Obama went on to say the use of chemical weapons would be a game changer. By game changer, I mean that we would have to rethink the range of options that are available to us. Now, we're already, as I said, invested in trying to bring about uh, a, uh, a solution inside of Syria. Uh, obviously, there are options that are available to me that are on the shelf right now that we have not deployed. Uh, and you know, that's a spectrum of options. Uh, you know, as, as early as last year, I asked uh, the Pentagon, our military, our intelligence uh, uh, officials to prepare for me what options might be available. Uh, and I won't go into the details of what those options might be, uh, but uh, you know, clearly uh, that would be an escalation, in our view, of the threat to the security of the international community, our allies, and the United States. Uh, and that means that there are some options that we might not other ex otherwise exercise uh, that we would uh, that we would strongly consider. I visited the sites of the alleged chemical weapon attacks and met with victims, with survivors, with rescuers, doctors. Uh, and it does, to me, it's, it's clear that there was some kind of chemical that was used. It was quite a small scale in the, uh, the attacks that I saw. Uh, and the effects of it were, were clearly from some chemical, but they didn't appear to be as severe as they would if it was one of these, these banned chemicals that um, uh, the, the world is afraid of, that uh, the regime uh, in Syria do have access to. Uh, most of the people survived and recovered within five days, whereas if it was a gas like sarin gas, which there was a lot of talk about it being this, um, they, they wouldn't have been survivors to this extent. And Tracy Shelton, you also talk about the uh, not only the health effects, but the canisters that were recovered that uh, that carried the chemicals that seemed more in line with uh, tear gas canisters and, for instance, sarin. Or could you talk uh, talk about the the delivery uh, uh, instruments that were used for these chemicals? Yeah, they were uh, quite small little plastic canisters. Uh, they did also have a metal section, which it seemed to be some kind of small explosive, maybe designed to, to spread it. Uh, the the, vic the um, witnesses, their neighbours, had heard a helicopter coming overhead, so it was believed by, by everyone on the ground that it was dropped by air, uh, which would seem to indicate the regime is that they're the only ones that have access to, to helicopter. Uh, the one I spent most of my time researching the attack was in the, the Kurdish region who haven't actually sided clearly either with the government or with the FSA, with the opposition groups. They've kind of kept a, a stand in the middle. So there was a lot of speculation as to who would have, would have attacked this area. Um, but yes, yeah, since it did appear to come from, from an airstrike, uh, it, it does indicate the regime. But it, it, it's, again, it was um, the, the gas, the effects of this gas were not really uh, as, as, as harsh as it would have been if it was sarin gas. Um, also, it, it seems a bit more um, uh, worse than, than tear gas, but no one has actually managed to identify what it, what it was, what this chemical was yet. Tracy, you begin your piece, the horrific chemical weapons attack that probably wasn't a chemical weapons attack, by saying Yasser Yunus went to bed around midnight, April 13th. When he woke up two days later, he was in a hospital and his wife and two young children were dead. Can you tell us the story from there? Yes, well, he'd, uh, he it was actually dropped into their home. Um, it it uh, fell onto the courtyard stairs just outside. So when he woke up, he'd opened the, the door. Uh, his only recollection was, was seeing some, some smoke. Um, and then he'd, he was in a coma for the next few days. Uh, from there, I spoke with the neighbors who had, who had come in to help, and uh, they'd found the two, two young boys were dead. Uh, the mother later died in hospital, so that, that was the whole family that was inside the house. Uh, the neighbours that came in to help them, they also fell ill. Most of them were in a, a coma also for a day or two. 
uh, and then the, the next party to arrive were the Kurdish police and members of the of the Apica forces, the, the Kurdish militia forces that controlled the area. And many of them also felt ill it, up to the next to uh, people arriving on the scene like three hours later. Uh, and even doctors that treated these victims after they were moved to the hospital in Afrin, um, many of the doctors even suffered effects, but much more mild effects. Um, yeah, so this it, it definitely indicates some kind of chemical that's working here because none of these people had injuries from any kind of explosion. Uh, it was just a, a, a chemical reaction. Uh, Tracy Shelton, you've also, uh, in, in other articles uh, uh, in, uh, in the conflict zone, uh, dealt with the Al Nusra group. The, the United States calls them terrorists. Uh, you say in one of your articles that one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighters. Could you talk about your your interviews and the time you spent with the Al Nusra group? Yeah, it's a it's such a complicated situation in, in Syria, and I guess the the. The main purpose of that of that comment was to show that uh, the the word terrorist is often used. To, it, it was always used politically, and depends on what side you're you're on. And it, it doesn't mean that um, whether they are terrorists or not. It's just it's it's a term that's used for um, uh, if, if basically if it's someone who stands against what you stand for. Uh, this is this is the term you use to describe them. Uh, President Bashar uses uh, the term to describe the whole opposition forces. Uh, America, Al Nusra, because they are affiliated and they've recently come out to say that they're affiliated with Al Qaeda. Um, yeah, so I mean, many of these groups in the in the opposition on the government side and uh, throughout Syria are using methods that could be described as terrorism. Can you explain the difference between sarin gas and the kind of gas that you're talking about? Uh, what is legal? What is illegal? Uh, well, there's uh, the convention in the I think 1993 banned a certain, uh, certain uh, listed a certain amount of chemical weapons that were banned. Uh, the ones that were much more fatal than, than others. There's certain things like tear gas they have been banned in certain countries, uh, but not the, under this international convention. So yeah, I think what uh, the the thing that uh, people a lot of people don't realise is that we're not just talking about any chemical, but certain chemicals that have been internationally banned and do have a very high, uh, very high death rate when they're used. I wanted to ask you to respond to reports about sarin gas being used. Um, first, uh, this is Syria's UN Ambassador Bashar Jaffrey speaking at the United Nations. The Syrian government has always emphasized in Damascus, the capital, as well as in here, that it will not use if it possesses any chemical weapons against its own people. And I stress this point, which has been highly controversial and manipulated by the enemies of Syria to serve their hidden agendas. However, medical personnel, some, are saying the exact opposite. This is Dr. Ubada Alabrash, a Syrian volunteer doctor working for the Union of Syrian Medical Relief Organizations, which runs hospitals for the Syrian opposition. When wounded people arrived at the crossing, they were suffering from suffocation, breathing difficulties, they were vomiting, and large tears welled up in their eyes. These are symptoms of chemical gas. When the patients arrived after the initial examination, we took blood samples from them. That was Dr. Ubada Alabrash. Um, Tracy Shelton, your response to what he says. Uh, yeah, I, I got similar accounts to uh, when I when I arrived at different hospitals from from medical professionals and from rescuers. Uh, yeah, people were definitely suffering from a, a chemical reaction. But um, yeah, as I said, uh, until now it hasn't actually been identified what chemical it was. Um, so until that's uh, until we get someone to officially test these chemicals, and, and the strange thing is in the. The, the people that I spoke with in Afrin actually have the canisters from this attack, but they couldn't find anyone internationally to test it. 
So um, I think this, I'm not really sure why no one has really stepped up to do that, but I think it's a very important thing that this, this chemical being used is identified uh, before we jump to conclusions about anything. Uh, Tracy Shelton, let's turn to one of your video reports from September, Life and Death in Aleppo. Here you take viewers on patrol with a group of rebel soldiers telling the story of Issa, uh, Ahmed and Kasim in the days before and then at the very moment they're killed in their back alley post by a tank blast. The rebel fighters manning this two block stretch of back street are friends. For several weeks, the men of this battalion in Aleppo have made the street their battleground, their social club, their kitchen, their home. Most were civilians before the revolution began last April. Some were teachers, students, laborers. Others joined the opposition after defecting from the government army like these men. We have been with the freedom fighters for eight months. Why do we do this? For God and to overthrow the regime. Some moments they seem like any group of friends anywhere, chatting, laughing, drinking tea, reminiscing about family and friends back home. But here, all that can change in an instant. In the mornings they clean up before breakfast, but this morning they were caught off guard. <laughs> Bring an ambulance, bring an ambulance, for God's sake. Oh, Mahmoud. Issa, the group's leader and father of three, his 17-year-old brother Ahmed and Sheikh Mahmoud, father of a newborn baby, were killed in the blast. And this is another report by Tracy Shelton of Global Post from Syria in September called Surviving Aleppo. Here she shows the horrific aftermath of a helicopter bombing attack and goes shoulder to shoulder with those digging through the rubble to find survivors. A Syrian army helicopter bombed this three-story building Monday, leaving rubble crashing down onto two young families. But then, just as all hope seemed lost, a tiny miracle emerged from the destruction. One-year-old Hassan survived without a scratch in a blast that killed his parents, his cousins and all his siblings. As doctors examined him at a neighbouring hospital, rescuers described how he was found. His mother had used her body to shelter him from the falling concrete. He was discovered unscathed, still cradled in her lifeless arms. He stayed for around six hours underground until we got him out with our simple tools, and thank God he survived. As we wrap up, Tracy Shelton, you've spent uh, most of the last year in Syria. You're now in Turkey. You've just come out. T tomorrow is World Press Freedom Day. Can you talk about the dangers of being a journalist, the journalists who've died, and what you think needs to happen? Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, difficult to work in Syria, and it is getting harder um, as the opposition uh, becomes a little. Weak. The extremist elements are growing. Uh, the revolutionary aspects of the revolution are, are slowly uh, being taken over by by other agendas, and yeah, it's, it's not as it was never safe to operate in Syria, but now it's it's very difficult to know where um, the dangers are coming from. But uh, yeah, so it, there are a lot of precautions that you need to take. Uh, one of my colleagues has, has been missing for, I think, five months now, James Foley, and many others as well have been killed, injured, uh, missing. So um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult place to work and one that um, uh, requires a lot of planning and a lot of precautions. And what needs to happen in Syria? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. It's a it's a big mess now, and I think international interve intervention could have worked maybe a year ago, um, but now it's become very complicated. There's a lot of elements involved, and they're talking about uh, the possibility of arming the rebels now. Um, obviously, something has to happen as far as. Uh, Yes, the, the Syrian regime are killing many people, and this, this fighting is killing many people. But the answer is very complicated. You have a, 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 an opposition that is fractionated, and they all have different agendas. They have different uh, 
um, different affiliations, many with outside groups. So it, it's a very complicated question. It's, and I think that uh, even once the, the regime falls, it, the fighting is probably not going to stop for, for quite a while. Mm -hmm.